to deal with. <laughs> okay, let's get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Mark Longo. I'm one of the organizers of the Complexity Group, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Terry Deacon received his PhD in Biological Anthropology from Harvard University, where he subsequently served as an assistant and then associate professor. He then moved on to Boston University, then Harvard Medical School, and finally, the University of California, Berkeley, where he is a professor of anthropology and neuroscience and is also the chair of the anthropology department. His interests include brain development and evolution, the origins of language, biocultural evolution, and emergence. I first met Terry at a symposium on cooperation here at Stanford uh, in a room full of very <coughs> smart people saying the occasional smart thing. Uh, Terry stood out. His comments were both remarkably out there and incredibly insightful. Terry seems to have developed a way of looking at the world in something akin to a photographic negative. This perspective has allowed him to focus not on the material substances or specific mechanistic relationships that we typically use to trace causality, but rather on what's not there because what's not there just as well defines what's there as what's there. The not there that is most relevant to understanding what's there are the dynamic constraints which can channel systems into what would otherwise be improbable physical realizations. In his new book, Incomplete Nature, How Mind Emerged from Matter, Terry uses the concept of constraint to redefine, or rather to clarify, what we mean by energy, work, and information. He proposes a three-tiered hierarchy of emergence whereby constraints that develop at lower levels interact to produce novel constraints at higher levels, culminating in self-referential dynamics which exist via self-perpetuating constraints. <coughs> These so-called teleodynamic processes persist by virtue of their ability to cause their own creation, or at least to influence their own creation. By tracing the interaction and development of constraints across these various hierarchies of emergence, starting at the most basic level of thermodynamics, Terry attempts to develop a naturalistic understanding of ends directed systems without resort to mysterious forces or homuncular crushes. Uh, that's my two minute attempt to summarize a very challenging 500 page book written by an incredibly synthetic thinker. Uh, I actually don't know how Terry is going to manage to communicate his rich ideas to us in the hour or so that we have him, uh, but I do know that I'm personally uh, very much looking forward to the attempt. And I urge all of you to, uh, to take a look at his book for a fascinating tour through our world through Terry Colored Lenses. Uh, with that, I present Terry Dickens. Well, at least we have the same color shirt. <laughs> that must mean something. But only an hour and a half, huh? No. I had planned four. <laughs> now, Richard, <Please. laughs> uh, I'll say at the beginning, um, I do have more to talk about. Um, I've created a talk that has three alternate endings, and when we come to there, I'll ask you which alternate <laughs> ending you want to hear. It's sort of like, you know, this computer gaming world out here. Maybe this is similar. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what I will do, to try to do, is to give you sort of a thumbnail sketch uh, of the argument that I've made here. Um, and uh, again, my point in doing this is uh, not to beg questions, but act actually to set up at least the groundwork for asking the right questions. Um, I'd like to start with a uh, quote that comes from uh, the philosopher Jerry Fodor. He actually wrote it. Uh, in a review of, uh, I think it was the New York Review of Books, um, or the, I guess the Times Book Review, something like that. Basically, his, his quote is this, uh, nobody has the slightest idea how anything material could be conscious. Nobody even, <laughs> nobody even has the slightest idea what it would be like to have the slightest idea how anything material could be conscious. So my intent today, whether we get to consciousness or not, is to at least, uh, get so that we have the slightest idea of what it might be like to think this thought. 
Um, maybe not to answer the question all the way, but I want to get, get us to the point where we can ask the question in a way that we're not appealing to miracles, uh, other worlds, uh, quantum strangeness, and so on, in order to solve a problem that should be fairly straightforward, that seems to me. So uh, the title of my book, Incomplete Nature, this is a variant of the picture that's on the cover. Uh, uh, this is uh, from a marvelous sculpture uh, produced by a Korean sculptor, uh, Il Ho Lee, uh, the faces inside the face, inside the head, are mine. Uh, I created this. It's, it's meant to represent uh, lots of different aspects of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and one of the main features is the incompleteness of it, that there's a hole in the middle to some extent. Ultimately, that's roughly what I'm going to say about us, and I'll try to make sense of what I mean by that. Um, so the subtitle is How Mind Emerged from Matter. I'll talk more today about how life emerged from matter, uh, because I actually think it's the more basic question and leads to the way to ask the right question about mind. Um, and then I've written over here on the right um, a sort of carry-on subtitle, or why living and mental phenomena are neither material nor energetic, and yet are nonetheless physical and capable of introducing novel changes into the world. Um, so at first you might say, well, if it's not material or energetic, uh, it's not in the world, it's not a real thing. And uh, uh, Mark did a very good job of summarizing the, the core arguments, um, though it may have gone by a little fast. Uh, I'll try to do the same thing a little slower with a few more examples. But it's basically to say that we've ignored something if we think only the energetic and material phenomena that we're looking at are important. And by that, I am not making any metaphysical claim about some other world or um, some special consciousness stuff that's out there. Uh, nor am I going to make a claim that everything is, in some sense, roughly conscious. So um, the, the, the two horns of the dilemma are characterized by this picture for me. Um, on the left, a homunculus caricature of uh, what it's like to have a mind for somebody to be home. That is little guys in your head. Uh, and we all know the problem with the little guys in the head story is there's a little guy in each of their heads, too. And uh, the little guy is all the way down. Uh, that's not much of an answer for us. But the point I make in my book, and I won't belabor it here, is that oftentimes we have snuck into our theories little men, little homunculi, without knowing it. Um, where we have uh, somebody is feeling. Uh, so for example, Antonio Damasio talks a whole lot about the feeling of what happens and how consciousness is feeling. Uh, the question is, who's doing the feeling? And what does it mean to have something doing the feeling? To just say feeling is not enough. Um, uh, there's basically a hidden homunculus in those kinds of stories. And there's many of those kinds of stories. Uh, I need to avoid those. Uh, on the other side of the great gap, there are what I call golem theories. Uh, theories that basically say, that, no, no, we're just some machine cranking stuff out of this consciousness stuff is just sort of epiphenomenal. Um, uh, it's imagined. Well, of course, the real question there is a similar kind of question. Well, if it's just imagined, then who's imagining it? Um, and on, on down, it becomes a very difficult story to pull to as well. And so um, I'm basically going to try to answer um, or at least start the answer to a question asked by Ilya Prigogine um, some decades ago. He says, we need an account of the physical world in which it is absurd to claim that it produced us. Uh, and uh, why do I think it's absurd to make this claim? It's because if you think about our best theories of the world today, the so-called theory of everything, we basically aren't in it. Um, we're in it as, as gluons and quarks or molecules and stuff. But we're not in it as conscious beings. We're not in it with meaning, with value, and so on. None of that makes it into physics. Now, that doesn't mean that physics has to do that. But we need a theory of the world in which uh, it's not absurd that those things do exist. And so uh, if, if anything, I want to get us away from the absurdity story. Well, since we're talking about complexity here, I want to start with this move. Um, and first of all, to think about Claude Shannon and his notion um, of complexity. I'll talk more about Shannon if in one of the endings you want to talk about information. Um, but so for example, Shannon's notion of entropy uh, might claim that these, that these two uh, strings of numbers, one is more complex than the other. The problem is the one on top, which is more complex, is a random sequence. Uh, not even a, a sequence of pi, it's just a random sequence um, drawn from one of these random number series. 
Uh, the bottom one, in the one below it, is in fact not a random sequence, though it turns out to be a very interesting number, a number built by just stringing together counting numbers, uh, one after the other after the other. Uh, it turns out to have very interesting properties as well, uh, but it has lower um, entropy, and that is it's more ordered, uh, but in the Shannon sense of it, it has less capacity to carry information, uh, and that's because it has redundancy in it. Um, the measure of Shannon entropy has not been uh, strongly favored over time as a measure of complexity, as many of you probably know, uh, for simple reasons that uh, complexity, we want something more than just something that is an equal probable string uh, as we move from number to number to number. Um, so we get other versions of complexity like that from Kolmogorov uh, that's basically about compressibility. It's about uh, can we take some string of data, some information, and compress it down in some ways. And of course, the uh, uh, string is oftentimes used to generate so-called random sequences is the di di digital expansion of pi, uh, which I have part of here. Um, uh, but it's an entirely compressible string. In other words, it doesn't have the kind of uh, complexity that Shannon's does, although if you were to take any stretch of this string, it would have most of the properties that you would think of a uh, highly uh, high entropy Shannon number. Uh, but in fact, uh, you can compress it down with a very simple algorithm to produce the digits of pi. And that compressibility tells us that in some sense, um, it does not have that kind of complexity uh, in that sense. Uh, and finally, the one that I prefer, although I don't say much about it here, I want to come back to at this in another way, is by Charles Bennett. Uh, the father, really, of, of quantum computing uh, uh, from IBM. And one of, one of his early insights, and I've, I'm mostly just going to play on his early ideas here, is uh, recognizing that when we talk about information, we're actually not just talking about some logical relationship. Information is physical, he says. It's one of his claims that he says over and over again. You have to think about information as being something physical. Every medium that we use to store or convey uh, information is a physical medium. And that physical medium has physical properties. And its informational capacity has to do with those physical properties. Um, and his measure of complexity, a much more interesting one, but again, in one sense, it is kind of flat, um, is it's the work it takes to compute something. So the amount of work it takes to compute the digits of pi, actually, it turns out you've got to do a lot of computer cycles to produce it. Um, the same thing in terms of a random sequence, such as the one up on top, takes a lot to produce it. Um, so his measure, he calls it logical depth. I'm going to use an analogy to logical depth to go on, because I think there's a better way to talk about complexity than any of these. Because in many ways, I think all of these ways of talking about complexity are flat in an interesting sense. And so let me go on and give you a sense of what I mean by that. I mean, when we think about the concept of depth, think about it in two different ways. Think about conceptual depth. So if I give a simple description, for example, like the phrase, a simple description, it has very little conceptual depth. It doesn't take a lot to sort of put it together. Um, however, if I present you with a quote from a fine work of literature, um, uh, oftentimes you'll find this tremendous depth. That is, you can keep reading it and reading it and reading it and you get more and more out of it. Um, one of the examples I like to use from biology has to do with genetic sequences. A genetic sequence can be um, a very complex in the Shannon sense or very constrained uh, and with limited information carrying capacity. But it turns out that some genetic sequences, those in some bacteria, uh, can be read more than once but with a frame shift. Now, those of you who know about how this works, of course, there's codons that are made up of three different uh, nucleotide crosslinks each. Uh, a frame shift means that every read is a different code for a different uh, amino acid in a protein. To get the same sequence that you can read with a frame shift that doesn't give you a stop codon, that doesn't kick you out of the process, but produces another protein that's usable, that's a quite complex, and I would say, an informationally deep sequence. A sequence that overlapping includes lots more information, a little bit like this conceptual depth I'm talking about. Uh, and it's that kind of notion that I want to get you to think about in the following way. I want to call it dynamical depth. Um, not logical depth, not computational depth, but dynamical depth. That is a physical conception. Um, if you think about building a clock, a complicated mechanical device, or a <coughs> mechanical device that does computation, uh, whether it uses mechanisms or 
you know, electrons moving around and holes and so on. Um, uh, they have what I would call low dynamical depth. I'm going to try to give you a sense of this notion of dynamical depth in a minute. And you just heard um, Mark give sort of rough sense of this. Um, on the other hand, I want to say that what distinguishes organisms and minds, what brains do, is that they have a high dynamical depth. That is, there's a lot of layers of dynamics that go into constructing what they are, what they do on the surface. Uh, and the dynamical depth is going to be not just you know, how many things are done, how many operations. Because uh, you can produce an incredibly complex computation that is still has very shallow dynamical depth. So I want to give you a sense of what I mean by that as we build. Because it's going to be the logic I use to talk about what I, what I mean by something emergent. Basically, I'm going to talk about what I will call emergent dynamics, a dynamics that, that has sort of novelty to them, in a sense. Um, the reason I've gone through this whole process is to resurrect a concept that's disappeared, um, disappeared since the 19th century. And that's this concept of teleology, of end directedness. Um, in fact, we've replaced it in modern times mostly with a term that comes from a guy named Colin Pittendridge, um, teleonomy. That is, it has a kind of a, a rule that drives it so that it looks like, it looks like it's end directed. Um, uh, thermostats can look like they're indirected guidance systems, and they look like they're indirected because they take errors and feed them back into the system and sort of correct their activity to come to some set point or end point. Um, the point I want to make here is that the natural sciences have mostly excluded teleological explanations because they are inherently incomplete. Uh, and uh, by incomplete, I don't mean anything positive here. I mean, the, the reason we got rid of them is that they're incomplete, they're black boxes. Um, when we say this was caused because of a purpose, uh, we haven't descri described anything about mechanism, about how it happens. All we said is it's over there somewhere, it's in that box. That's a teleological argument, and for that, for good reason, we in the sciences don't want arguments that say, hey, you can't open the lid of that box and look at it. It's not very helpful. Um, going back to Aristotle, uh, he would describe these things as final causes. Um, that for the sake of which something happens. Uh, that's why I came here, to, for the sake of giving this presentation, hopefully why you came here to, to listen to me rattle on about this stuff. Um, you come here for the sake of something that hadn't happened yet. So the future was in some sense, the final, the end, was in some sense dictating your activities. Um, it's not the future determining the present in any simple way, but it's rather some representation of a non-existent state that might have happened, or could happen, or might happen, maybe not, that initiates a bunch of physical work that got you here, for example. Um, as a result, it's not a potential consequence, and it's not a represented content itself. Um, it's not even a functional goal that actually exists. It's not something that actually exists in the world. So the question you might ask is, how could it exert any physical causal influence in the world? That's one of the reasons to get rid of teleological arguments if, they, if you're basing them on this kind of a, of a logic. What I'm going to try to do is to show you that there's a way to construct these kinds of causal phenomena that are really teleological, not just teleological-like, um, uh, by virtue of nesting dynamics in an interesting way. So the question becomes, uh, how can something not there be efficacious. Uh, and that's sort of what I'm going to try to get across. And I, I am going to start a little mystical on you here, um, just to get to the sense of it. Um, the reason that I'm interested in how something not there can be efficacious is because a lot of things I've just been talking about have that feature. The meaning of my words is not something in my head, not something in your head. Uh, in fact, there's neurological activity going on in your head and my head. The meaning is not that. Um, the value of these words is not that. It's not something in the future that hasn't happened yet. Um, the value is something that's not actually there. Um, but the same thing I'd say about a function. A function is not the stuff that's going on. A function is some kind of consequence. It's for the sake of which we construct a device, or for the sake of which, so to speak, an organism acts. Um, they're not something physically present. And so I'm going to use this um, sort of ancient hint to give you a sort of beginning metaphorical sense of what I'm after. So this is from the, the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. Uh, this is number 11 if you want to go back to your reference books here. 
find it. Um, uh, and this is my twist on the various translations. There's lots of different <coughs> translations, and of course it can be read many ways. This is my way of saying it. 30 spokes converge at the wheel's hub to an empty space that allows it to turn. Clay is shaped into a vessel to take advantage of the emptiness it surrounds. Doors and windows are cut into the walls of a room so that a protected space can be occupied. Though we must work with what is there, use comes from what is not there. The point I'm going to try to make throughout the rest of this argument um, is that what we're interested in is in the use. We're interested in the freedom, the options that come from the space that's not filled, so to speak. The possibilities, but in order to create those absences that can be used, that have functionality, so to speak. Um, there has to be something physical as well. This is not an a-physical story. It's a story about how to construct these kinds of physical supports for the absences that make those physical supports useful. So if, if that's not enigmatic enough, hopefully um, it'll get worse as we go along. <laughs> um, Part of the reason I've moved towards the concept of something absent, what has led me to think about absence is the, the importance of the concept of constraint in the world. Um, and I think it's much more, much more important than we give it credit for. So uh, one of the ways that it catches my attention is that, in fact, in many ways, um, we get in trouble when we talk about something being ordered or organized. We get in trouble because we're usually using a model. Uh, we use some kind of model of what we mean by an order, what we mean by a symmetry, what we mean uh, by organization. Uh, the problem is that a model is not something in the world. It's a representation. The model doesn't do anything. It's the physical stuff that's doing something. If the only order is, in effect, in a model, if it's in the mind of the beholder, so to speak, it's not much in the world. It's not doing something in the world. But I think since the 1940s, we've begun to reformulate notions of order, slowly but surely. I don't think we've come all the way around to it. Uh, but here's a quote from way back in the 1960s from one of my heroes, W. Ross Ashby. He says, while in the past, biologists tended to think of organization as something extra, something added to the elementary variables, the modern theory, based on the logic of communication, basically I'm shaman, regards organization as a restriction or constraint. To exhibit order or to be organized is to be less than fully chaotic in this sense. It's to exhibit constraint. So rather than think about things as being like some other model, represented as some regularity, all we need to recognize is the more constrained something is, whether it's dynamical or physical in some geometric sense, the more limited the variety. Uh, the more redundancy is there, and therefore we would describe it as more ordered. But what this means is there's sort of a continuum between the sort of platonic notion of order on one extreme and, and true chaos at the other end of that extreme. As you move towards the platonic, things are more ordered because they're more constrained. Constraint is, in a sense, a negative way to talk about order, to talk about organization. Uh, and as you'll see, this concept comes back again in many interesting ways. Um, the classic discovery that sort of drives a lot of complexity thinking, of course, are things like this. This is, of course, the Lorentz attractor sort of modeled. Um, uh, the Lorentz attractor, as most of you probably know, one of the very first so-called attractors, um, is a statistical entity. Um, it is not dynamically determined so that things co coalesce onto a single value, but over time, this the trajectory of change in the Lorentz attractor, originally, of course, meant to describe some atmospheric processes, um, will largely fill the space. Almost, if you let it run to infinity, so to speak, almost every point in the phase space that's characterized here in three dimensions will effectively be traversed by some part of this trajectory. But most of the time, most of the cycles of this trajectory follow closely on this sort of butterfly wing-like shape. Um, that is, they're statistically close to something, but they never converge on a single value. Um, it is orderly, and we look at it especially this way when I show density here on the right, where many of the more dense paths are represented, even though it does eventually fill the space. Um, we recognize that it does have a kind of order, and in fact, there are even spaces in this that it never traverses. And in fact, in some ways, those spaces that it never traverses are interesting. 
Um, because, in a sense, they exist in a precise way, even though they're actually something absent. Uh, and it's that precise notion of absence that I'm after here for the concept of constraint. This is a representation of a constrained process in which um, there are some aspects of this phase space that are never traversed, but those spaces are very precisely defined. So again, constraint, let me just sort of talk about it. Real world dynamical systems are inevitably subject, subject to constraint. They're both constrained extrinsically and intrinsically. I'm actually gonna focus mostly on what I would call intrinsic constraints. In other words, they do not realize all the possible configurations and distributions that are possible. And they're typically highly, sometimes it's called itinerant, that is they pass through the same area again and again and again. Um, the same region, though not exactly the same trajectory. And though we often consider constraints as extrinsically imposed, they can also arise intrinsically. And they're typically due to the asymmetry of the options to change that are implicit in the interactions that are going on in the components that determine these trajectories of change. Um, they're intrinsic because there's something asymmetric about the way interactions occur in the system we're looking at. Um, it's, this is the cause of the spontaneous increase of entropy. I want to argue that, in effect, the second law of thermodynamics could be thought of as an attractor problem. That is, things are attracted by the asymmetry of trajectories. There's more trajectories towards equilibrium than away from equilibrium, vastly, vastly more. And as a result, it's an extremely highly probable tendency to move in that direction as opposed to away from it. I'll describe this as sort of a geometric cause, although the geometry I'm talking about is, in effect, the geometry of a phase space, of a chance space. You might say the geometry of chance. Um, and the point that I'm going to struggle with is to talk about, first of all, dynamical systems that tend to, quote, self-organize. And if you understood my twist on the notion of organization, throwing it into the concept of constraint, I'm talking about systems that self-constrain. And in this regard, I'm going to reverse, inverse, the way people normally talk about the concept of emergence. Because I think we've made a mess of this concept over the past uh, century. Uh, I'm going to talk about less, not more. So although it's been argued really since the time of Aristotle that we must think of the whole, whatever that amounts to, as greater or somehow transcending its parts, uh, I think it's been the source of considerable confusion. And it opens anti-reduction arguments to the criticism that they e invoke the equivalence of magic. So there have been some terrific critiques of many of the theories of emergence. Uh, the classic ones have, of course, uh, come from Jaguan Kim, those of you who read the philosophy of this stuff. Um, lots of critiques that the concept of emergence doesn't really make sense in a lot of ways. Uh, that, that you really can't make a good sense of what's extra, what's coming into the world extra. Are they new rules, new laws of nature, new what? Um, my point is that that whole perspective has been in error. So the claim I want to make is the inverse of this. Um, that is, the whole is less than the sum of its parts and all of their possible interactions. That when something becomes more ordered, more organized, more constrained, and ultimately becomes end-directed, um, it's because constraints have been multiplied, have been amplified internally for the most part. It's going to make it interesting. So, the whole is less than the sum of the parts. Keep that in mind, because I think that's the way out of this problem. Um, just to give you a couple of really trivial examples of this, let's talk about function. Um, here we have a motor. Um, the function of this machine is determined by constraints on the dynamical excursions it can assume. In fact, it's not going to violate any laws of physics. There's no new laws of physics involved in the function of an engine, right? Um, what's happened is we've not allowed some kinds of degrees of freedom. Some kinds of dynamics don't take place. And it's precisely because these constraints that we call it a function, that it doesn't do everything, that this, things don't move all over the place. Their precise limitations are what give us the function. And in fact, we know this in part because if we change these constraints, if we loosen some bolts here and there, allow more degrees of freedom, uh, the function will be lost. Um, once we reduce those constraints, uh, we lose function. So function is not something on top of the thing, not extra. It's actually uh, the constraints that provide the function. It's something less. 
Um, now, let me get a little more personal. I think life, we also have to think of life in these terms. A living organism consists of a vast and complex system of reciprocally synthesized molecules. One molecule makes another molecule, makes another molecule, makes the first molecule in vast, complex ways. The stability of this reciprocal closure depends on their possible interactions being highly constrained. That's why we have the specificity of the proteins we do. They play a very significant role, of course, in constraining the chemical reactions that can take place, making some very probable and others very improbable. Um, so though we think of our death as a loss of something, uh, what's lost is this constraint. In fact, um, as many degrees of freedom of these chemical reactions become restored, and the entropy increases. Basically, when, when I say that my body is, is breaking down, it's no longer working, it's because those constraints are breaking down. I'm not becoming more constrained, I'm becoming less constrained, at least at the chemical level. Now, I'm unfortunately constrained at the psychological level, there's things I won't be able to do. Um, in fact, most of the things I'd like to do aren't going to be there. But that's because of the constraints. Lose those constraints, and I'm not here anymore. Loss of life is gain of, is gain of freedom, so to speak, at least at the molecular level. So, here I am talking mostly in systems talk, but I'm going to argue now that the way we talk about living and mental processes, even those of us who want to escape the sort of computer models of it, the sort of simple computational or even mechanistic models of life and mind, um, into systems theory stories about this, we still haven't gone far enough. My argument here is that dealing with these various dynamical systems, complex dynamical systems models is not enough. That the concept of self-organization is not going to be enough to explain not just mind, but even life. Uh, life is not just a self-organized process. And I'll try to make that point today uh, as clearly as I can uh, before we move on to other topics. So let me just read off what I say here. A self-organized dynamical process develops towards a pattern of dynamics that produces a rate of constraint dissipation. I'm going to use constraint dissipation the same as entropy production. In fact, I'll try to show you why they're the same in a minute. Um, which keeps pace with the imposition of external perturbations. You have an open system that's being perturbed all the time. Um, it can become self-organized, but it's becoming self-organized in the process of getting rid of the constraints that you're imposing on it, getting rid of the energy that you're dumping into it getting rid of the extra material that's being poured into it. Self-organization serves this in a way. In this way, physical systems self-organize in the process of destroying the very conditions, for example, the energy gradients, that make them possible. In other words, they're specifically self-undermining. A self-organized process which uses open system dynamics in which you have to continually heat something, continually perturb something, continually modify something, they do become self-organized, they do add constraints, they do become more regular. Um, but in fact, they're doing so in the process of rapidly destroying the gradient that produces them. In fact, um, we use this concept, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, of maximum entropy production to talk about this. Um, but for this reason, self-organization cannot provide an adequate account of the dynamics of life. Organisms must depend upon component self-organizing processes Yes, we need self-organizing processes. I'm not going to say that they don't exist within us. I think they're good. Um, we need them for the generation of order. And yet, organisms must preserve the conditions that make these self-organizing processes possible. Self-organizing processes of themselves destroy the basis of their own order generation. Living processes cannot do that. Living processes have to do more than that. They have to preserve those. The question is, how could that be possible? So here's the logic of my notion of dynamical depth. Um, the first level of dynamics I'm going to talk about, I call homeodynamics, to be a little bit more general than thermodynamics. Um, because thermodynamics mostly works at a certain level of scale. Um, but the thermodynamic process is one that goes, in a sense, a spontaneous change towards an equilibrium, or what I would describe as constraint dissipation. Uh, a homeodynamic process is a process of evening things out. 
a process that brings things down to a relaxed state, uh, that minimum amount of work, and so on. Uh, equilibrium, a loss of symmetry, and so on, equalizing uh, all of the variables. Uh, thermodynamics does that, uh, but there are other systems that do this as well, and that's why I've come up with this term homeo, because it's talking about evening out, so to speak. Um, uh, the second level I'll talk about is basically what we typically call self-organization. I want to replace that term uh, precisely because I think both the name self and the concept of organization are very misleading. There is no self here, um, obviously, in what amounts to a self-organizing physical process. Um, so I like to call it morphodynamics. Why? Because it refers to the fact that these are dynamical processes that produce form, morphologies. Uh, morphodynamics, it turns out, it was used by other people. It's, it's around. The term is used for other topics. Interestingly enough, it's used in geology and in embryology uh, in various ways to talk about something similar, to basically talk about um, order-generating processes um, that are driven by non-equilibrium systems. Uh, what's going on in these processes, I'll describe it very quickly here in words and show a couple of examples to sort of walk you through it. You generate constraints and regularities in a dynamical system. They rise from internal interactions, from system internal asymmetries in the way things can interact, the trajectories of possible change that limit what's possible. And they do this in response to being perturbed. And what's going on is they become internally constrained in a way that maximizes the way they dissipate the constraints coming into this system, so to speak. Uh, I'll try to give you a more concrete example as we move along. The final level of um, depth, and you can see I've nested it within these other two, is what I'll call teleodynamics, and Mark mentioned this term before. Um, teleo, of course, referring to n-directed dynamics. Uh, and I want to argue that, that self-organization is not sufficient because there's another level of dynamics, a level of dynamics that actually does preserve the constraints that are the boundary conditions for making this possible again and again and again self-organization by itself doesn't have. So self-reproducing or maintaining these constraints. Uh, in other words, constraints that produce the constraints that make constraint production possible, a kind of interesting circularity. And you'll see why this circularity is, is real dynamical circularity. I think you need this to go beyond where we've been in systems theories and other kinds of dynamical theories. You need to have more than simple self-organization. Uh, and that's, that's the, the nugget that I want to get by today. Uh, because I think if we begin to understand that, problems of the nature of life, problems of the nature of mind, of consciousness, of the nature of information are going to change. We're going to have a different way of talking about them. Because, in fact, we've been trying to reduce them too fast, trying to greedily bring them down to a thermodynamic process or a self-organizational process, in which, in fact, they're more complicated. So first of all, I want to sort of walk you through the logic. Let me back up here. The E's are referred to emergence. Um, what I want to argue is that we need to use the concept of emergence in a very precise way. And in this precise way, in fact, there's two kinds of ways I'll use it here. One is to talk about how thermodynamic systems or homeodynamic systems in general, if they're inter opposed with respect to each other in certain ways, spontaneously produce these kinds of form generating processes morphodynamics. And the morphodynamic processes, I would say, are emergent from um, the thermodynamic processes. They have very different properties that are interesting, nonlinear properties that we find very, very surprising in some ways. What I'm going to argue is certain relationships between morphodynamic processes, um, special relationships that they can fall into with respect to each other, produce emergent dynamics, kind of dynamics that has very different features that I call teleodynamics. So my concept of emergence is going to be very precisely defined, and it's defined in dynamical terms, not in terms of sort of new laws of nature, not in terms of sort of magical new functions showing up, but just simply in terms of new kinds of dynamics. And it's certain aspects of those dynamics I'm going to focus on uh, to make sense of it. So let's just sort of talk about these in a little bit more detail. Um, what's that emergence transition? Um, I've tried to describe each of them here, and I'll just sort of quickly go through it. Um, thermodynamic processes spontaneously dissipate constraints within a closed dynamical system, and as a result, they maximize the production of entropy in those systems. A morphodynamic process spontaneously amplifies and propagates constraints 
Um, now, a morphodynamic system is generated um, by thermodynamic processes. Uh, you don't have it generated without, in a sense, entropy increasing in the whole system. Um, it's in an open dynamical system. We're looking at a component of that dynamical system, which as a whole is maximizing its entropy. Um, that morphodynamic processes I mentioned a few minutes ago maximize the rate of entropy production by that system as they begin to develop. It takes time for them to develop, but as they develop, entropy, in a sense, is generated externally by those systems much more rapidly. In some sense, in service of, although this is sort of teleological talk, of maintaining sort of constant level of entropy internal to the system, even though you're constantly perturbing it. Uh, finally, teleodynamic processes spontaneously generate, capture, and reproduce constraints. It's not just that they're generating them. They generate them, they save them, so to speak, so they can be reproduced in some sense. Uh, they do this within and across separated dynamical systems. In other words, organisms can produce other organisms that do this as well. That is, they generate units uh, that actually capture constraints, generate new constraints, new form, new organization, and are capable of reproducing it. Um, this is a process that counters entropy increase in the end. Living organisms, uh, in fact, don't allow, we're not flames, we don't burn it up as fast as possible, we shunt this process through as many sort of circuitous pathways of chemical reactions as we can to drag as much work out of this uh, gradient as we possibly can. And organisms get better and better at finding new ways of doing this over time. Um, and it's what makes evolution possible. <coughs> evolution wouldn't be possible if there wasn't this way of capturing maintaining and reproducing constraints that can now be used to generate, capture, and reproduce new constraints. That's what makes evolution possible. If you didn't have that kind of ability to capture constraint, uh, you couldn't evolve. Um, so just very quickly, I want to introduce two other terms. Um, and I want to introduce this one by just sort of looking at sort of the way we normally think about uh, the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and here I have this picture that shows four different steps. Um, we don't normally imagine that things can move from this one to this one to this one to this one. Um, this is a, a little movie we generated in fun, and I usually like to play it backwards. I haven't played it backwards here for you. Um, but normally when something like this goes backwards, we say, ah, 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 that didn't really happen spontaneously. Um, all of these things didn't just start moving and run into each other just the right way so that they fall into a nice neat triangle and spit out this white ball. Um, uh, the, the fact is that I have suggested that if one could look at this movie, measure the velocities by very careful measuring of how fast they're moving, look at issues of friction and so on, and actually if we stuck a bunch of actuators on this picture uh, so they bumped all the balls in just the right way and just the right velocities, we could get very close to this. Um, with a lot of information, a lot of computation, a lot of logical depth of analysis, um, we could probably get this movie to work forward. Um, what I want to suggest is that this is effectively what life is doing. Uh, but to do this, you need a highly constrained initial condition to make this possible, extraordinarily constrained, to get to this point, really unlikely. Um, it's not impossible. One of the nice things about the second law of thermodynamics, it's a law that is, in effect, a law about <coughs> tendencies of the world. It's not about what must happen. It's about what is extraordinarily likely to happen. And that means uh, you can push things in the other direction under certain circumstances. Um, so what, that, what I'm saying is if it's merely improbable, then it's not impossible. Um, and that's the loophole that leads to life in mind. Um, to look at morphodynamic processes, let me give you three very different versions of morphodynamic processes. Um, the top one, of course, snow crystal growth. Snow crystal growth is interesting, uh, and it's interested a lot of people, caught my attention a generation ago, um, precisely because it's a process that amplifies constraints. As snow crystals grow, uh, they're falling through different domains of temperature, pressure, and humidity. Uh, and uh, at those different domains, ice crystals form in different ways. Uh, they form spires under certain conditions, they form plates under other conditions, and of course they melt under other conditions. As a snow crystal is growing, um, it's in effect at different times in different regimes, different thermodynamic regimes. 
and it grows a different kind of structure. <coughs> Owing to the nature of heat dissipation, heat is dissipated roughly uni uniformly off of this growing structure. And so those areas that are warmer um, are growing slower than those areas that are colder. And as a result, it sort of balances itself out as well as it's growing. Um, and finally, um, what happened historically in its growth, by this I mean the history of its growth, beforehand constrains what can happen next. If you're growing spires, then what can happen next is going to be constrained by the ends are only tips, uh, and you have to change your growth pattern. And so this enormous variety of snow crystals we see is the result of constraints amplifying constraints. Because the constraints of growth get frozen and limit what can happen next, the constraints amplify and amplify in a symmetric pattern. Produces this incredible structure of snow crystals. This is constraint amplification, order that's generated by constraints amplifying the possibility, constraining the next constraints, constraining the next constraints, and so on. You get something that gets more and more ordered over time. Interestingly enough, microscopically, which has now been looked at, if you look at these structures uh, by <coughs> scanning EM, and there's now been a couple of techniques where you can do it and keep the system cold so the thing doesn't melt on you. Um, you actually look microscopically, and the microscopic structure is fairly random. Um, you might think that it's nice, neat lattices, but in fact the lattices aren't all that neat at the microscopic level. Macroscopically, they become neat, interestingly enough. It's a statistical phenomenon because, of course, water molecules are vastly, vastly smaller than these crystalline lattices. So the, it's a, in one sense, it's a global geometry that gets regularized. And that's another characteristic of self-organizing processes. It really takes a kind of uh, um, expansion of scale and numbers uh, to generate this. The second one I'm going to talk about in just a minute a little bit more clearly. Everybody's favorite in the self-organizing physical world are these Bernard cells. And if you've never seen Bernard cells forming, um, uh, it'd be fun to try. I've never actually succeeded in getting it to work very well. Uh, but the story is supposedly true, and I've seen many examples of it uh, shown to me. Um, uh, typically, the way you do it is you put a thin layer of oil in terms of a flat, round surface, best of its round, it turns out, um, but not necessarily. Um, and you heat it up slowly to a very hot temperature, to the temperature beyond which normal conduction of heat through uh, that uh, material is no longer giving off heat really fast enough, that it's accumulating heat faster than it's giving it off by conduction. And it begins to convect heat by moving molecules. Uh, up and down. What happens is that molecular movement depicted here by arrows, um, in effect, uh, begins to put, send the hot ones to the surface and the cold ones then sink because of weight differences. Uh, and the process begins to generate a, a kind of convection cycle, but the convection cycle very quickly regularizes because the maximum way to give off this heat, to maximize entropy production, as the theory goes, uh, is that you want to do it most efficiently in the surface, to dis divide the surface most evenly in terms of these convection cells. And it turns out, of course, hexagonal packing is the best way to set polygons on the surface. So hexagonal packing spontaneously generates. Uh, the one final example of self-organization is the result of adding new things continually is actually adding new parts uh, in growing meristems of many, many plants. Uh, one of the great, exciting, beautiful mysteries of of plant geometry is this Fibonacci spiral structure that you see on the surface of many plants. Or if you cut through a celery or you look at the surface um, of a pine cone and so on, they all have these beautiful interlocking Fibonacci spirals. Fibonacci, because the alternative spirals uh, have uh, adjacent Fibonacci numbers uh, for many of these, uh, corresponding to how many spiral elements there are in each. Um, why a Fibonacci spiral? Why such a beautiful uh, regularity. Uh, the answer is that basically the new ones that are being generated are coming into the most space. Uh, they're generated from the center and expanding and pushing the periphery outwards as everything is growing simultaneously but you're adding new growth points. And it turns out that it's an easy one to generate in plants because in fact it's generated by the fact that the last one that generated is utilizing more of the nutrients and generating a lot of plant hormones uh, at that point. And it turns out that the next one is just at the lowest concentration of these inhibitory things and the highest concentration of growth positive. 
And so in effect, it's filling space in the most efficient possible way, just simply by these gradients. But it ends up, by virtue of this, producing a very, very regular feature. And so part of what I want to talk about is this development of correlation, this development of constraint. So basically, as each one of these is produced, it constrains where the next one can go, which constrains where the next one can go. And then the last five constrain where the next one can go. The last 10 constrain where the next one can go, and so on. Constraints are amplifying, and it becomes more and more orderly over time. Early on, it's not nearly as neatly ordered as in a sunflower later on, uh, as it's grown many, many components. Um, so let me just say one other thing about my way of talking about entropy and constraint. I think when entropy is increasing, what we're saying is that constraint is decreasing and vice versa. When constraint increases, entropy um, is decreasing. Uh, and my own predisposition is to rethink the concept of entropy and the concept of constraint. Um, because I think that they are in fact inverses, but I think the concept of entropy doesn't tell us as much as the concept of constraint. Interestingly enough, both of them are sort of negative ways of talking about something. Entropy is a way of talking about uh, the correlations that are lost uh, between things. Constraint is talking about, um, again, the negative features, the things, the degrees of freedom that are lost uh, in something. So dissipative systems, a system that is constantly forced away from equilibrium, is constantly accumulating constraints and will therefore <coughs> cause that system to evolve towards a distribution of dynamics that degrades those constraints as fast as they accumulate. Um, that's what makes self-organization possible. Internally, that means it generates constraints and becomes more orderly in order to get rid of constraints in a global sense. Uh, this is called the maximum entropy production principle. Many people have tried to apply this to living organisms or to ecosystems, saying, oh, <coughs> ecosystems must be entropy maximizing systems. Um, as people have looked more closely, you can see that during a time, especially of rapid growth or decay, they do become entropy maximizing. Uh, but as they become stable, they don't any longer become entropy maximizing. Um, and so basically, this is what I mean by self-organization. Self-organization system has this feature. The problem with the concept of self-organization, and the reason that I think we need to go to this next level of dynamics, is that the concept of self here is, in effect, just a heuristic. All it's saying is that the constraints that are interesting are not imposed extrinsically. The constraints that are imposed extrinsically are not what determine the regularities that show up internally, intrinsically. You need them because you need to have the system organized. It needs to do work, in effect, to produce these internal constraints. Um, but those constraints are produced by internal constraints, internal dynamics, internal asymmetries in the way the components interact. Um, and it's that internal nature of this that I'm going to focus on next. Um, here's just a depiction of four, sort of four stages of Bernard cell formation. You're heating the bottom of this liquid. Um, as it forms, you begin to get what are called roll cells, that the system begins to turn over in, in roll-like fashion. Uh, but as it heats up, this is unstable. It doesn't give off the heat as rapidly as, as it could. And it begins to begin to break up these roll cells into hexagons and into regular patterns. And what you get in the, eventually when it reaches its sort of maximum stage, which is able to give off the heat as efficiently as possible, effectively you get this nice, neat hexagonal structure. Again, hexagonal structure is not determined by some sort of crystalline logic of oil. Um, it's determined by space filling geometry, by constraints on how efficiently you can pack space. The size of these is determined by the viscosity uh, and the mobility of, of the molecules in, in, involved in this process. So using that depiction, I want to bring up two other weird words that hopefully you'll be able to grasp pretty simply. Uh, one is called orthograde and the other is called contragrade. Um, Basically, this is uh, just another way of talking about what we in the old hippie generation used to call going with the flow. Um, orthograde is going with the flow. That is, you're not fighting the current, so to speak. What I mean here is the asymmetric tendencies for system systemic change um, can be distinguished in terms of what's spontaneous and what's not spontaneous, what's going with the flow, so to speak, and not going with the flow. If something in a closed thermodynamic system is moving towards a state of greater equilibrium, 
of less constraint. Uh, it's going with the flow. I call that an orthograde direction of change. Um, uh, to get that system to move away from equilibrium, you have to do work. You have to impose something from the outside. Um, and that imposition causes the system to ch change in a direction that is in the opposite direction that would happen if it was not being disturbed. And that I call contragrade. Very simply going with the flow, going against the flow. But here I don't mean the flow of some liquid. I'm literally talking about the spontaneous tendency. Leave it alone, what will it do? Things do have a spontaneous asymmetric tendency to change. And in the simplest case, it's a thermodynamic tendency towards equilibrium, towards constraint dissipation. Uh, if their directionality is determined by system internal, formal, or geometric properties, um, we can describe them as orthogram. Uh, what I want to say about the second law of thermodynamics, it has to do with the asymmetry of possible directions of change, of trajectories at which the system can change. It's an asymmetric set of probabilities. Those probabilities say that there are many more trajectories aimed in one direction, so to speak, directories of, directions of change, than in the other direction. Um, I like to even think about it in Aristotelian terms as it's almost like a formal cause. The phase space of possibilities is not symmetric. All directions of change are not equal. Um, but that creates orthograde change. Um, there still has to be work done. That is, molecules have to keep bumping into molecules to, to move in that direction. But what's interesting about a system, if it's truly an isolated thermodynamic system, the amount of molecular collision work being done when it's out of equilibrium, and the amount of collision work being done when it's in equilibrium, and now no longer undergoing orthograde change, it's changing moment to moment because there's the same amount of molecular work going on. The same amount of molecules are bumping into each other, the same amount of momentum are being transferred from molecule to molecule. That amount of work hasn't changed. But the amount of work you can do with it has changed. We sometimes call it free energy. Again, energy is one of those terms that we still don't have good definitions for. I'll leave it to those of you to think about it. But what's basically happened is that thermodynamic work cannot be done, and yet the amount of molecular work that was being done at the beginning of this process and at the end of this process has not changed. But it has gone through an orthograde change. It has changed towards equilibrium, towards uh, what you might say is in the, fa the geometry of its phase space, of the possibilities of trajectories, um, is asymmetric. It's followed that to the most probable um, set of trajectories. And we'll stay in those most probable st st states of trajectory um, for a very long time, unless it's perturbed again, concurrent. That is, forces push it away from there. So if <clears throat> there's something external to that that pushes something, I call that contragrade. Um, <clears throat> Why have I used these terms instead of just talking about thermodynamics? Because what I'm going to claim is that you need this way of thinking about the process in order to understand what I mean by emergent dynamics. Because what I'm going to claim is that a morphodynamic process generates a new orthograde that didn't exist before, an <coughs> orthograde predisposition that did not exist before. And a, the transition to a teleodynamic system generates yet another orthograde system. What do I mean by orthograde? The spontaneous tendency to change in a certain direction. So let me see if I can give you some examples of this. So first of all, the thermodynamic example. We have a pretty good way to think about this, this one. Uh, there's one way that, you know, in a sense, you just sort of don't constrain the process. You relax the constraints, so to speak. Um, you let you sort of jiggle the table a little bit, and it's much more likely to go towards the left than to the right. Um, that's just simply because there's many more trajectories that can lead towards distributions that are not this nice neat triangular distribution. Um, it takes work, in effect, uh, maybe I have to set up my activators to shoot the balls in just the right way in order to generate uh, this other formation very easily. It takes a lot of work to do that, um, or I have to pick them up and move them to do that work. Um, that's moving it in the contragrade direction. Uh, we can talk about it as falling and forcing. Things tend to fall to Earth. We have to push them away from Earth. Um, I think what's interesting about Einstein's theory of general relativity, he basically came up with a sort of a geometric way to talk about falling and forcing, uh, in which things uh, orbit the Earth, follow a curved path without being accelerated, so to speak, by some extrinsic force. Um, they are following a straight line in a curved space-time. Uh, that's a, in a sense, kind of like a geometric story. It's orthograde. 
Uh, and I think you even talked about Newtonian and Einsteinian dynamics in orthograde and contragrade terms. Uh, but I want to go in a different direction. And so I'll take you there by looking at morphodynamics and heliodynamic systems. Um, let's talk about a very, very simple morphodynamic system. Um, a whirlpool formed in a stream. So long as the flow um, of water coming in here, down in the stream, say going around a, 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 an obstruction, as long as it remains constant, the whirlpool will persist. And it'll persist in its regular features. Now, it's not the same. Whirlpool, moment to moment, is made up of different things every fraction of a second. Um, but it has some regularity that it exhibits uh, from moment to moment. If you disturb this whirlpool without changing the flow, if you stir it in some other way and mess it up, um, guess what? It will tend to go back to the regular flow that it has. And that's because all the other chaotic flows, um, in effect, cancel each other out. All the ways that molecules are not sort of moving in correlation with each other actually do work to inhibit those what I call uh, sometimes sort of non-consistent, non-coherent, um, non-concordant vectors of movement. They cancel out over time very quickly, and the whirlpool forms again. This is a dynamical orthograde tendency in the whirlpool. It's already generated by a contragrade process. That is, you have to be doing work. You have to throw new water into the system to generate it. But once you've got a constant flow of water, you now have a system that has a new orthograde tendency a tendency to form regularity. And if you disturb it, that regularity, the regularity reforms. That's an orthograde process. I have to stir it against that circular dynamics in some way. Um, to do work on it, I have to do something contragrade. Um, now, that also takes work at the thermodynamic level, but it's now work also at a form level. Not all kinds of stirring will disturb it. Finally, living things have an orthograde tendency as well, but it's much more interesting. Um, because living things, if they begin to run out of fuel, find more fuel. If they get damaged, they repair themselves. Um, if they begin to break down, they reproduce themselves. Um, this is something quite different, but it's an orthograde tendency. You push something off its developmental tendency, and it will tend to work its way back. Uh, living things have a more complicated kind of orthograde tendency. What I wanted to say here is that this is the way I want to talk about emergence. That is, new orthograde tendencies show up. New kinds of geometries of change become possible as we cross these thresholds. Uh, and that's how I want to talk about emergence. So that what I want to say here is this is a different kind of end directedness. This is true end directedness in some ways. And it's one of the reasons we describe uh, these kinds of things as functional. <clears throat> So let me talk about self in this sense. <clears throat> As I said, morphodynamic processes, they emerge out of synergistic forms of contragrade homeodynamic processes. You have to do work to generate whirlpools. You have to do work to generate Bernard convection cells. Uh, work is being done, um, and entropy is increasing as snow crystals grow. Um, you need that as a base. But if they're organized in just the right way to continually perturb something at a constant rate, um, oftentimes that perturbation will produce this kind of order that I call morphodynamics. Uh, morphodynamic processes generate intrinsic constraints, but they're dependent upon the persistence of these external features. Um, even though the constraints are generated internally by internal processes, um, that is dependent on what's outside. And as soon as what changes in the environment change the flow, and the, and the whirlpool will change or disappear. Teleodynamic processes, in contrast, um, emerge out of specific, specific synergistic forms of morphodynamic process interactions. That's the claim I'm going to make here. In just an analogous way, that thermodynamic interactions can generate these kinds of form-generating processes, I'm going to give you some examples of how teleodynamic processes, processes that actually have something like self, that reproduce themselves, that repair themselves, that are not subject to these kinds of limitations, don't destroy their own boundary conditions, um, are generated ultimately by the interaction of morphodynamic processes. Very specific work that's done 
that I will call morphodynamic work. Uh, analogous to, t to thermodynamic work, but at a higher level, having to do with producing contragrade morphodynamic interactions. Um, so in this sense, teleodynamic processes reciprocally generate the constraints that make themselves possible. We generate the constraints that keep the system running, that keep the chemistry within certain limits over, our, over time. And ultimately, we generate the constraints in reproduction that make new whole systems possible. That's maintaining those constraints. Uh, just the opposite in one sense of what self-organization by itself does. But what I'm going to try to sh show you is that the combination, certain combinations of self-organizing processes, certain interactions, can actually produce that. In this sense, then, teleodynamic processes are truly self-creating and self-referential. Um, and in this sense, I'm going to argue that the term self does work for organisms. We need the concept of self for organism. Everything we talk about in terms of organism, function, adaptation, reprodu reproduction, they're reproducing themselves. They're supporting themselves. They're repairing themselves. Uh, the information in their genomes is about themselves, uh, self matters. <coughs> we couldn't have that kind of talk about whirlpool, for example. Um, just an aside before I get to that point, and I'm already sort of uh, run past where I wanted to go here. Um, constraints. One of the problems that we get into when we talk about emergence is we want to talk about you know what's new and therefore that you can't reduce it. I'm going to argue that you actually there's not a simple reduction of life, not a simple reduction we can do of mind. So that a reductionistic argument is not going to work. By reductionistic argument, I mean looking at the parts and saying that, okay, somehow it's just this react interaction between the parts that matters. I'm going to say, yes, it is the interaction between parts that matters, but it's actually the constraints, the interactions that are not undertaken, that are not pursued, that are what matter. And for that reason, constraints are not something that you can reduce. What do I mean by that? If something that's not occurring is not a part. Something that doesn't take place is not something that you can now say, okay, I'm going to find the parts for what's not occurring and, and now build it up. Um, we need to already know the constraints. We need to already pretend we understood the constraints that got us there in the first place. Because when we lose constraints, we break things down to their parts. Um, uh, we don't have what's necessary. What's necessary are those constraints to maintain life. And I'm going to claim maintain mine. In fact, I'm going to make a strong claim that we are, in some sense, those constraints. By that I mean in terms of consciousness, for example. So let me now uh, end this section, and then maybe we can take a break, and if you want to go in one of the other options, um, uh, just to talk about a very simple teleodynamic system. Can I explain, in the simplest possible system I could think about, how you could go from morphodynamic processes to teleodynamic processes? And although I didn't take my hint from this guy, um, from a couple hundred years ago. Um, he did a pretty good job of getting at sort of what I'm talking about. This is Immanuel Kant, uh, the philosopher, writing in, 18, in 1790, excuse me, um, uh, in this t critique of teleological judgment. He's, at this time, also struggling with the idea of teleology and science. Eventually, gives a very unsatisfying answer in my book as to whether teleology makes sense in the world or not. But here's what he says uh, about organisms. He says, a machine has solely motive power, whereas an organized being, means an organism like you or I or a plant, um, possesses inherent formative power. Remember that phrase, inherent formative power. And such, moreover, as it can impart to material devoid of it, material which it organizes. This, therefore, is a self-propagating formative power, in which every part is reciprocally, both ends both end and means. Now, end and means are functional concepts. They're teleological concepts. And what he's trying to show is that organisms have a kind of internal teleology to themselves, in which I can say that these molecules are there to produce those molecules, which are these, there to produce these first molecules, and so on, like a snake biting its own tail. Um, mechanism, motive power, that is dynamical, thermodynamic, chemical kind of organization. What he's interested is in formative power, how the form gets generated, how constraints get generated in my terminology.
The organism is something that produces constraints, produces form, that it can impose upon material that doesn't have that form. So how can I produce a system like this? Um, I'm going to put together two kinds of molecular processes that are quite familiar and I think have been, in many ways, falsely assumed to answer the whole question. But when together, I think they do. Uh, the first one is something called autocatalysis, oftentimes called reciprocal catalysis. A catalyst is a molecule that causes another molecule to change or causes two molecules to, to come together and be fused together or split molecules apart. Um, so here's molecule E um, splitting molecule A. Bingo, it knocks it apart. A little bit of energy is released in this process. Uh, and in fact, the energy is now picked up. Uh, the breaking of this bond, C is now energized in this process. Um, and because C is energized, now when it bumps into yet another molecule and splits it off, some of the energy of splitting this molecule is passed on to this molecule, which just happens to be molecule E, which can now split off another molecule like this. Uh, this is a self-amplifying catalytic cycle. Autocatalysis means if you have a lot of this substrate around, this one and this one, floating around, start with just one of these, with this one or this one, uh, just one of them in the solution, it will start a process that accelerates and accelerates and accelerates and produces a whole lot more of E and C uh, molecules and breaks these apart. That's autocatalysis. It's a self-organized process. It amplifies constraints. It increases and increases this disproportion of molecules. And in fact, in a local area, it will produce very high concentrations of these molecules until it runs out of substrates. <coughs> the other molecular process I'm going to talk about is self-assembly. Uh, this is a term applied in biology to talk about molecular structures that basically fall together, so to speak. It's, again, an orthograde process. Uh, this is a process that we find in the formation of viral capsules. Uh, why do they fall together? Because they have basically a symmetry, both in terms of structure and in terms of charge, typically, sometimes of hydrophobic, hydrophilic features, that cause them simply to stick together uh, because of this. So you produce a whole lot of these, and they tend to spontaneously form into structure. Uh, same is true of, of course, cell membranes. Uh, they're formed not by virtue of their shape, as in viral capsule features, but in fact by virtue of hydrophobic and hydrophilic features that cause them to self-assemble into sheets or into globs. Um, and then I show here one of my favorite ones. This is a little movie of uh, microtubules, the structural elements inside of cells. Depicted down here, a stain. The microtubules are stained for a fluorescent green down here in this cell. Uh, the, what you might call the skeleton of cells is made up of these. And it's not just the skeleton of cells. These are basically the pathways down which molecules get moved and shipped from one part of the cell to another, um, play a significant role in cell motility, along with other molecules like actin and so on, um, within the cell. What I show up here on the top right is, of course, that these microtubules spontaneously form as the molecule tubulin. Here you see these little pieces. Um, are in the solution, but if you change the salinity of the solution, you change the solute or solute around it, um, there are times in which they tend to stick together or tend to fall apart. So you can regulate the growth and the elimination of microtubules by changing local concentration of solute. Uh, by increasing or decreasing the number of microtubule molecules, their concentration in an area, or changing salinity and other features uh, of that. So, this is an orthograde process. All of these are orthograde processes. They tend to run themselves. If you let them go, you get them started, they just tend to move on. Now, there's a problem with these two molecular processes because alone they're not going to explain what we want to explain by life. And yet, together, they have an interesting symmetry that I want to bring to your attention. Autocatalysis um, spontaneously amplifies um, this sort of chain reaction and in this process liberates energy but it produces a high local asymmetric concentration of just a small, it's supposed to be small, number of molecular species. Uh, that is, the catalysts become highly probable in this local area, as do the products of catalytic reaction becoming highly probable in a very local area. Um, unfortunately, it requires that there's not much diffusion, because these catalysts have to interact with each other, so to speak. If you separate them off in space, uh, if they diffuse apart, uh, especially when substrates get low concentration, the diffusion basically takes them apart. 
the, the, the second law of thermodynamics says they're going to get more and more distant from one another. And as a result, the process stops. Autocatalysis requires proximity. Catalysts have to be in close proximity. It requires certain concentrations of these molecules, these substrate molecules. But now let's look at enclosure by self-assembly, like in a viral capsule. Um, this is a spontaneous molecular process again. It's a tessellation, that is a formation of some kind of a sheet. Um, and it occurs because of this stereochemical feature, the way these things tend to fit together geometrically or by charge and so on. Um, but the interesting thing about this is as these things grow, they actually constrain molecular diffusion. That is, if you produce a sheet or a container, things can't diffuse in and out or beyond it. Uh, depending on what it's made of, of course. Um, but to grow a system like this, you have to have a persistently high local concentration of a few species of molecules that tend to stick together. In fact, as it grows, it depletes the concentra local concentration will stop growing. So what I show here in red and blue are that, in fact, the demands of each of these processes complement each other. That is, by producing a lot of one kind of molecule in a local area, you're doing exactly what self-assembly needs. Producing enclosure that stops diffusion, you're actually holding molecules that need each other, so to speak, reciprocally, in the same position in space. And so, to describe that, I come up with a simple process that I call autogenesis. Uh, a simple molecular process that can be described in a number of ways. The top one is sort of using a kind of viral shell model. The bottom one uses a kind of um, tubulin model, model, microtubule model, in which self-assembly here is to produce tubes, self-assembly here is to produce enclosures. But the difference here is that the catalysts here shown in red and their interaction here, shown in these other colors here, um, the catalysts generate a side product and that side product just happens to be one of the waste products of this, tends to be a self-assembling molecule, a molecule that will tend to stick to itself to make sheets or tubes or enclosures. But that means that self-assembly will occur in precisely the place where there's the most autocatalysis going on. That means when something encloses molecules in that vicinity, it'll tend to enclose exactly the molecules that tend to produce the enclosure. That means if this enclosure is complete, it will in fact stop catalysis. Catalysis will no longer occur, but it has captured all of the molecules, likely captured all of the molecules necessary that if it breaks open again in the right environment, it will tend to reform itself. It will tend to repair itself. In other words, the constraints generated by each of these self-organizing processes are each the boundary conditions that make the other one very, very likely. It's just that in this case, they become circularly independent. Each produces the boundary conditions that make the other one most likely. And as a result, now the intrinsic constraints that they produce, that each of them produce, produce effectively a self. A unit that generates itself, that represents itself, that represents the constraints necessary to regenerate itself again and again and again, but intrinsically. That is, those constraints are not from the outside, now they're all maintained in this system. When it's broken apart, it tends to make itself again. When it's solid, it's got the potential, if damaged, to reform itself. But not only that, if you break it up enough, you scatter these parts out enough, you'll produce two, or three, or four. Because it's capable, for the same reason that it can reconstruct itself, it's also going to be capable of reproducing itself. Now notice that this is reproduction and repair without anything like DNA, without any complicated biochemistry. It's a very, very simple system. I wanted a simple system that has two characteristics. Number one, it's empirically testable. Number two, it's a thought experiment in which we know everything that's going on. We don't have to sort of guess what's causing its end directedness, what's causing its reproductive capacity. We don't have to imagine that there's some special molecule like DNA or RNA that makes this possible. Um, this makes it easy for us to think it through, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip this one since this takes a little bit of time to roll, and I'm taking too much time as it is. What I want to say about this is how is it different than just that organization? The way I describe it is that it ratchets entropy production. 
then each of the two self-organizing processes that are components of autogenesis in this case are dissipated, and they are each independently subject to maximum entropy production. That is, if they were running on their own, they would generate entropy faster and faster and faster as they produce themselves. However, because it, each of them is halted by the complete self-assembly enclosure of the whole system, and done so before the boundary conditions for either of these things are exhausted, entropy production ceases. It becomes sta stable. And it does so before it's depleted the potential for doing this again. It has, in effect, generated constraints intrinsically and captured them. It's not allowed those constraints to run to the end and finally dissipate what generated it. It's ratcheting entropy production, or you might say ratcheting constraint generation. Uh, entropy production is halted by the very process of entropy production in this case. There's a very simple model I like to think about this. Think about a, a building in which you have a door open at the top and a door open at the bottom, and the difference in heat is causing a wind to blow through the building. Um, that's maximizing the flow of entropy, so to speak, the movement of heat into the building and out of the building in this gradient from top to bottom. However, if the flow of air becomes strong enough, it can close the door at the top. In other words, the very process of maximizing entropy production can generate new constraints. And that constraint can change the whole way that entropy is generated uh, in this system. That's effectively what's happening here, is that because intrinsic constraints can be generated, those constraints can, can, can change the constraints, the boundary conditions in which entropy is generated in these systems. And therefore, those constraints can be captured and therefore used again. And of course, to do any work at all, as I talked about in terms of machines, it takes constraint. So the capturing of constraints, the maintenance of constraint, is also the capturing of the potential to do work of a very specific kind. In this case, work that is indirect. Work that will produce the same system that can produce that work again. So this is the necessary condition for constraint creation. But it's also the necessary condition for information retention. Information, as we can talk about, or you can go back to Claude Shannon, has to do with constraint. Unless you have constraint, you don't have information. So what's happening here is this is the simplest way that, is, that I can think of to talk about a system that generates, captures, and can reproduce constraint. Those very constraints that reproduce itself, reproduce its capacity. It's a kind of self-referential system in this sense. So here's the sort of picture of classic ratchets that allow dynamics to go in one direction but lock it in another direction. That's effectively what we're talking about here is constraint is generated in one direction and it's not allowed to dissipate. But that means you can accumulate and build up constraint. That's the very essence of what evolution is about. And these systems could evolve, even a system as simple as I've talked about, because it opens up and captures other molecules in its surround. It's effectively every time it reproduces, every time two or more are produced, it's sampling the world. And molecules that aid this process, make it work a little bit better, will in effect um, now allow the better versions of this system to reproduce faster, to reproduce more effectively. And a kind of evolution is possible, a very limited kind of evolution, but it's effectively a kind of natural selection. Why? Because the work is more efficient you can produce more efficient constraints. <clears throat> so the point I want to say here is that lineages of autogenesis, autogenic systems, or autogenesis, I sometimes call them. Sometimes in earlier work I've called these auto cells, but they're not actually cells, so I've given up that term. They generate themselves. These are units that are self-generating. Um, the point I want to make here is this is truly the basis of self. To talk about organisms, what life is, the very definition of life, has to have this feature. It has to have this feature. Now, what I've just described here are not really alive in the way we would think about it today, but they have what I think is the essential feature of life, which I call teleodynamics. Um, what I want to say is that a teleodynamic system necessarily has a self. It has a kind of self-reference. The argument I want to make, even about consciousness, is to understand consciousness, there has to be something 
that is self-generated. That is a self with respect to which all dynamics occurs, with respect to which there's otherness, with respect to which there's non-self, with respect to which there's contrograde activity with respect to the dynamics of self. Um, you need to have this kind of dynamic to have self. My point here is that I think not only does life depend upon this, but this is the very essence of how our brains have to work to have consciousness. There has to be self. Self is not an illusion. Self is not an epiphenomenon. Self is the very essence, I think, of the dynamics of how brains work, not computation. Now, notice that what this means is that the, the, the dynamical depth of brains has to be much more than computation. The dynamical depth means that the thermodynamics of cell metabolism matters. That the morphodynamics of cellular interactions that produce global patterns of activity in the brain are producing the major features of order that have to be the building blocks of this process. And yet, for there to be self, there also has to be this special reciprocity between that morphodynamics. What I want to suggest then is that this is the essential threshold that has to be crossed. The level of dynamical depth that has to be reached to produce anything that is teleodynamic, anything that is indirected, anything that has self. And if it has self, it also produces normative features, value. There's non-self, there's against self. There's for self. Um, there's function. This allows us, I think, to walk all the way from basic physics all the way to something like meaning without abandoning our science, without bringing in magic to make the story work. So I'll stop there. You see three different buttons around here. And as we move on, um, I have a way to talk about the origins of DNA, why DNA has information, um, and what justifies us talking about it built from this kind of a model. Another one that talks about the very nature of information, why we need to change our concept of information. Uh, on these terms. And finally, uh, this consciousness, if you want to go and talk about consciousness. Each of these is way too long uh, for this group. But I wanted to set you up for these arguments. And so, of course, you could go to the book and find the answer to these too. Um, so thank you very much. You've been very patient. I've run a little bit long. Uh, thank you. Questions and you can escape too, of course. Yeah. 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 It either means I've said something totally stupid and you're embarrassed to ask me these stupid questions, um, or that I've explained. Yeah? Yeah, I'll throw something out there. Um, so, in your autogenic system, that, I can kind of feel that one, you have a couple differential equations, you know, reaction, diffusion kind of equations. You need two of them coupled. Yes. Right? So two systems coupled, and that kind of creates, a, it keeps, keeps the meat from kind of going off the rails, maintains the energy for me, right. Kind of feels like a metaphor for consciousness. I guess I need to see that. I don't see how you get from there to consciousness. Very good. It is. It, so far, it is just a metaphor. Yes, there are a lot of steps to get there. So I don't want to say that it's a simple, simple walk uh, from there. And obviously, evolution didn't do it right away. And bacteria, which have a much more complicated teleodynamic structure, are clearly not conscious. So there's a long ways to go. One way to put it is that um, I'm going to argue that this is that we can talk about any system like this as having a kind of sentience. There's a self in which it generates work to protect, to rebuild, defend itself, whatever that self is. And the self is defined here by the constraints that are protected and reproduced in this process. In fact, as organisms reproduce, of course, it's not the material or energy that gets reproduced. It's ultimately the constraints that get reproduced. Uh, that's the continuity of organisms. I want to argue that's the continuity of mind. It's the dynamical constraints that get reproduced, not the stuff, not the neurons, not even the specific neural pathways or synaptic weights that are critical to this. Uh, but in fact, it's the constraints that can be multiply realized in lots of different ways and probably never twice the same way in, in brains. The difference is that although I would say that 
the neurons themselves have a kind of cellular sentience. I like to call it vegetative sentience. In the same way that a bacteria does. Because they're responding to the input of signals from other neurons and trying to balance their own metabolism, uh, getting excited and kicking off action potentials and so on. Uh, uh, they're trying to maintain themselves being bombarded with all this environmental information from other neurons and so on. Um, uh, that sentience of the neurons, of the billions of neurons that make up our brains, I would argue is no part of the sentience of me or you. Um, that sentience emerges from the dynamics, and that dynamics is a higher order dynamics. The interesting thing about it is that the dynamics that my brain generates has as its component sentience component, sentient components. That changes the story. That is, it's a higher order level. It's yet a set of levels on top of what I just described. And that's why it's a little harder to go just to immediately jump up there. Uh, that's it's a hint more than an answer. Gosh.